Uh, bonjour. Uh, after Paula's talk on typography, we're now going to get a bit of uh, type nerdery, but not real type nerdery. I'm not going to get into uh, show you different proofs of type. Uh, my interest is, uh, has been in W.A. Dwiggins for several decades. And um, I haven't been, actually been thinking about his typefaces very much the last 10 years. I've been thinking about his advertising design. But in his typefaces, one thing that I always, that I always love is his Electra typeface. That's my favorite. And I was thinking about it in terms of uh, other things I've been discovering and trying to figure out, well, where did Electra come from? For those who don't know uh, W.A. Dwiggins, uh, just as a little beginning, he was an American uh, designer, born 1880, died 1956. And he was a book designer. He worked for Alfred Knopf for roughly uh, 20, 28 years of his life, doing freelance book design. He was a commercial advertising artist uh, for about 20 years before he began doing book design. And the same time he began doing book design, he began doing type design for Mergenthal Linotype. So he essentially had two, two basic careers, his advertising career from about 1905 to about 1930, and then from roughly 1925, 1930 to 1956 when he died, he was a book designer and type designer. He also uh, was a calligrapher, lettering artist, illustrator, ornamentalist, and in his spare time, he did marionettes. So what I'm hoping to try to do is bring all these things sort of together in looking at where Electra came from. Uh, so that's Dwiggins' his own marionette of himself that you're looking at, that he would have come out at the end of a play and do an author's bow at the end. The usual story of Electra is, occurs in a small booklet called Emblems in Electra that was put out when the typeface was released in 1935. And in it, uh, Dwiggins talks about how he had the idea from it after talking with a Japanese Buddhist priest who was also a famous scribe, Kobodaishi. He was a real person. Some websites claim he was, he was invented by Dwiggins. He was a real person. And uh, Dwiggins had discovered him through reading a uh, book by Lafcadio Hearn in the early part of the century uh, called Glimpses of Unfamiliar Japan. And that's the book that has some stories of how Kobodaishi did all these amazing calligraphic things, including the one that Dwiggins is illustrating here, where he, the emperor held up uh, paper on one side of his stream, and Kobodaishi, from the other side with a brush, held it up, and the letters magically appeared across the stream on the paper. This uh, image uh, comes, I'll show you the full part for it a little later on, but this quote comes from the booklet. Electricity sparks energy, high-speed steel, metal shavings coming off a lathe, precise, positive, say it with a snap. Take your curves and streamline them. Make a line of letters so full of energy that it can't wait to get to the end of the, me of the measure. So this is what Kobadaishi had told Dwiggins in this mythical talk. And the implication is that the typeface was a really modern one, lots of snap, energy, electricity, a typeface for its time. Because Kobodaishi had said to Dwiggins, why do you want to design a typeface like 1500, like Venice? That's not modern America. Don't do a Jensen. Don't do what people have been doing for the last 30 years at Monotype, at ATF, at you know, William Morris. But if you look at the, the brochure, the booklet for Electra, which you're seeing uh, in red there, there's no Electra. There's no snap. No electricity. Dwiggins was always a contrarian, even in his own publications. Here he, is, here he is trying to promote his typeface, and he's not showing it. Furthermore, on the inside of the booklet, before you get to the conversation with Kobadaishi, you have to go through 12 pages of illustrations of strange things like this ornament, which I love. The, the, the caption is, typographical ornament with landscape attached. And below it is a poem, not by Dwiggins, by William Rose Binet. In 1927, Dwiggins had been asked by Binet, who was editor of Saturday Evening uh, Review, if he would draw some illustrations, and then Binet would take those illustrations and add a four-line poem to them. 
and they'd put them on the front page of each issue of the magazine for one, for one year. And so why did Dwiggins put these in his, in his booklet? Just so he could show off the work he had done <laughs> and use the typeface. They had nothing to do with the design of the typeface. This is the typeface as you see it in the booklet. And one thing to remember about Electra is that it was designed for metal, for linotype, for letterpress, and for text. It was designed at 10 point, 12 point. It was not a display face. Linotype basically made text typefaces. Eventually, it, there was a 24 point made for display in newspapers and things, but its real intent was small. And people have had trouble making new Electra typefaces. The one I'm using is Linotypes from the mid-1980s. Nick Sherman made one recently, which was based on uh, letterpress proofs, which he sent me. And I decided it wasn't you know, quite right to use. Jim Parkinson's working on one for the new Dwiggins book that Letterform Archive is putting out, and apparently there's trouble with that. It's a hard thing to design. What is it about this typeface? And part of it, I think, has to do with the fact it's letterpress, it's small. We're not working in that world anymore. Uh, what you're seeing on the, on, on, on the side is a blow-up of the typeface from uh, a book done about Dwiggins' life in 1962, still letterpress. Notice the italic, by the way. I'll get to that very briefly at the very end of my talk. So my interest is, where did Electra come from? Because when I look at Dwiggins' calligraphy and his lettering over years, there's nothing like it before the typeface. And Dwiggins never talks about lettering like that until he writes the brochure the, 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 for the typeface after the fact. So this is the sort of lettering that Dwiggins was doing in the 1920s, very Caslon-esque. Or as he said to Griffith in the late 30s, my own personal form of old style type. And it's very typographically influenced. And take a careful look at the uh, A on the, in the word paper, because I'll see other A's with a similar form that are kind of moving away from Caslon and more toward what I would call Baskerville uh, in their shape. These are from paper company specimens. The one on the uh, left is 1923. The one on the right is 1925. So in 1919, Dwiggins had written a small article for one of the paper uh, companies he worked with. There was a magazine called Direct Advertising, and Forty wrote an article about letter forms. And he was talking about how basically they're either broad pen held at an angle, broad pen held flatly. We would disagree, I think, today and talk about uh, pointed pens and, and spread nibs versus broad nibs, but this is how he was seeing it. And essentially, he was saying there's either Caslon or there's Scotch Modern. Dwiggins was not uh, that keen on um, Bodoni, which we think of as the quintessential modern. He said it was okay. In the article, he wrote, Bodoni, in spite of every kind of defect in design, is a good letter. Individually, the characters are of awkward proportions and the curves are hard and mechanical. While Scotch Modern, or Scotch Roman, which he had discovered through uh, D.B. Updike, he said was, Scotch is a consistent modern design. The letters are so well designed and composed so evenly and simply that the face prevails as the best modern letter at the printer's disposal. He did admit that the capitals are way too heavy, which, which I'm not showing you here. But here is um, Matthew Carter's Big Caslon and Scotch Roman. that You can see what he's looking at. Because I think with Electra, he's aiming for a typeface that's in between the old style and the modern. So the image I was showing you at the beginning of Kobadaishi riding across a swollen stream, it comes from the top of a certificate he designed in 1925. It's a broadside. He sent them out to about 30 people. They were sent out to, to the honorary members of the Society of Calligraphers. The Society was a fictitious group. It had two people. Dwiggins was the secretary. The president was Hermann Puderschein, his alter ego. Everybody else was honorary. It was a who's who of people, not necessarily who's who today, but there were people that either Dwiggins knew personally or I think he wanted to know. I think a lot of it was done in order to get business. Alfred Knopf was one of the members. This was, this was before he ever worked for Knopf. I think it was one way for him to get work from 
Knopf. But he also had Fred Gowdy, his teacher in Chicago, on it. He had Bruce Rogers, the best-known American book designer, on it. Rudolf Ruzica, his close friend, woodcut, woodcut uh, artist and uh, type designer later on. He had a guy from the New York Public Library who was a, in, in charge of prints on there. So it was kind of a very interesting group. It was a mix of clients, would-be clients, friends, notable people, and people who knew, understood things like illustration and type. So he designed this uh, certificate, sent them out to them, told them there was no obligation to be a member. <laughs> uh, the, the, the illustration is stencil design, along with that decorative T, and the rest of it is totally hand-lettered. So on the right, you're seeing a blow-up of the lettering. And there's a scrap of this um, certificate in Boston with a note that says, the beginning of the modern experiment. It's not dated. It's presumably Dwiggins' comment. And what does he mean by modern? I've taken it to mean this is where he first has the idea for what becomes Electra. Since Dwiggins never does a modern typeface, well, until, late, until in the 40s. And if you look at these letters, you can see he's got flat serifs, he's got hairline serifs. Uh, the T is very much coming out of Scotch Roman. And the A is certainly not Caslonish. Letters like this start to show up after 1925 in his lettering. So you're seeing two more paper company designs here, uh, both from 1927. If you look at Daniel Willard, you can see the A I'm, I'm focusing on, and also at the bottom of the future of your, biz of your business, where it's very tightly packed and more condensed. Lettering that's starting to get more transitional, maybe modern, so it's hard to say which is happening. And it shows up at the same time in his book, Loud and Advertising. This book is published in 1928, comes out in the fall, but he'd been working on it clearly a couple years before, and the artwork is supposedly from 19, early 1928. It's kind of hard to say, but the letters re reflect that it was being designed, the binding, the title page, the jacket, between roughly June and October of 1928. So what you're seeing here is the binding. Unfortunately, my copy, the gold, is faded the artwork for the binding in the middle, and then the jacket. And although, although the jacket has simply caps on it, you can see he's working towards a more modern form of lettering. And there you can see his stencils in that um, green decoration. The stencils, he'd begin working with stencils. He'd actually been working with them back in, the, in uh, what, 1907, 1908. And he'd done some stencils here and there for things. But his serious work on stencils begins in the early 20s, when he's trying to figure out a system of how he can make shapes that can be created for ornamentation. He first works in the early 20s with uh, carving wood blocks and stamping and realizes that you can't see through a wood block if you want to position things properly and make complicated designs. Begins playing with acetate, discovers celluloid works better. And with uh, homemade knives, he cuts out various shapes to build up designs, some of which are very geometric, very Art Deco looking, others are very uh, floral, uh, plant-like, and even makes letter forms out of them. Now, we all think of Metro as Dwiggins' first typeface in 1929 for Mergenthaler, but actually there are two typefaces that precede it. One is a set of letters that he designed for Updike for a book J.P. Morgan was uh, uh, financing a religious book, the Book of Common Prayer. And Dwiggins did a set of capitals to go with uh, the text, which was set in Janssen type. The uh, matrices are actually now in a printer in Boston has them. But even less known than that is a typeface called Boylston. That was a street that Dwiggins had his studio on for a while, from 1917 to 1922. And Boylston was an unusual typeface. It was designed as letters that would be on gummed paper that you would buy, you would cut out the letters, and you would glue them down. Paste up a mechanical or typositor sort of proof. This is a page from that. If you look at, look at the text, it's from his book from the previous year. This is early 29. We don't know exactly when it was done. We know he got royalties, which was July of that year. Therefore, it was designed in the spring of that year at, at the latest. And that's exactly when he's, been, he's working on Metro. 
and on other type designs. So what I'm going to be talking to you about the rest of this talk is things that are happening simultaneously and we don't have exact dates. <laughs> so I'm guessing at what's influencing what. But there's that A, there's that T, there's the alphabet. This is a cover in this alphabet. This is thanks to James Parkinson's copy that he sent me images four years ago. There's the alphabet from sheets that I've gotten from a different promotional piece since then. Um, so you can see the letters. There's multiple letters, so when you paste them up, you have more than one. Not too many, though. This is how you use the system. And you can start to see some of the more modern, but still but really more transitional letter forms he's moving toward. Now, in 1928, the same year he does layout and advertising, he does a book of his own uh, writings. Uh, through Knopf. Knopf does it basically as a favor to Dwiggins, because Knopf wants to, to get Dwiggins as a regular designer. And the book is a bunch of little articles and essays and uh, fantasies, but what's amazing about it is each little essay has a stencil decoration at, to begin. And this is my favorite out of all of them, just so you can see what he could do with stencils, the curves he could do, the tiny lines. It doesn't have to be hard-edged geometry. Now, there's a number of very mysterious uh, pages uh, and stencils that survive in Boston with notes about them. This is one that says, circa 1925 stencils, pre-lino experiment. So theoretically, these were letters that Dwiggins made by cutting them out of stencils and printing them. Who he did them for is unknown. I know that he was considering working with ATF and for Bauer at that time. I've not, I haven't found any proof of anything ever happening. Um, but by 29, he does his first typeface for Linotype. Metro. And it's not a typeface that has any precedent either in his work. But we know why he did it, because in Latin advertising, he wrote at the end, talking about typefaces, that there's no good lowercase in any of the, cur the current sans serifs. And he was, he was really re referring to Futura. By the time uh, he got challenged on this, Gil Sands had come out and Cable had come out, and he was a little more sympathetic to those. But having written this complaint, Linotype said, OK, put up or shut up. And Metro was the result. Here's the, the, the black and the, the light, which both came out in December of 29. Meanwhile, in this year, he's, write, he's doing this modeled sans serif, which you know, he's playing with, and Lenhip says, nah, no good. So the whole thing dies. Later on, people discover it and see it as a predecessor to Optima. But look at the G there, which he says is not good enough. It's not for what he's doing, but it reminds me of the Gs that are going to occur in other things he's working on at the same time. This is March of 29. He's also doing this somewhere at the same time. It's undated. He says, attempt at Brummel letter. What he means is, he had done lettering for a book he was designing called Bo Brummel, which you're seeing there from a Google version. It's the most expensive Dwiggins book out there. Why? The author is Virginia Woolf. It's not the best Dwiggins book. But there's the lettering with white paint, that similar A, the G is getting a little better. He still has Caslon-like serifs and T. These are the stencils, though that he used to make those letters. So now he's applying his stencil ideas to letter forms. And at the same time, he's interested in a Didot typeface, which is what I'm showing you on the side, which he thinks is similar to what he's doing with Bro Bummel, a very light letter. He decides it's not strong enough. He calls it Diana, and these are his letters based on that Diana Didot letter form. These are made with stencils. What's interesting is on the bottom line, you can start to see Electra emerging. If you look at what's happening with the change of the serifs and the change of uh, the, the counter, especially of the lowercase n in Diane, all of a sudden there's this harsh juncture. Some of that's creeping into his lettering in the um, paper companies. 1930, rags in paper, those capitals, with very abrupt changes of weight. 
and this uh, undated thing from Warren, possibly 1932, 33. And look at the O in hour. Very odd combination of transitions. Another undated example of stencil letters. You can see the stencil breaks in the top line, filled in with ink at the bottom, and we pretty much now have the basis of Electra. Because the key thing now that's happening here is he's discovered if he makes the top serifs of the X height letters heavier than the bottom ones, he can drag your eye along the line in reading, which is what he wants to do with his typeface. Here's a blow up of other letters, also stencil. You can see that change in weight more clearly. There's that A that's more transitional, the G's a lot better. Here's where the marionettes come into play. So he's doing stencils, he's playing around with all these different, different type, typographic influences, Dido, uh, paper samples, etc. And his wife gets involved in a manuscript club locally. He gets involved, people who write things, one person's writing a play, they decide to make a marionette performance. Dwiggins decides, does the marionettes. The original ones are done with latex. Very realistic. So I've made a blow up of the woman here. This is from uh, The Mystery of the, Beg of the Blind Beggarman or Billy Brown's Bravery. First performances in 1933, but the marionettes are earlier. Some point he realizes that what he's doing with the marionettes doesn't read well in the dark from a distance. They're very accurate up close, but they just blend together the features of the face. So he starts to start carving his marionettes out of wood and making very faceted angles to the faces. These are examples that were done sometime late 30s uh, for a play that was written in, that was published in 1945 but never performed. And there you can see up close uh, the, the, the cheekbone of this woman and compare it to the face of the earlier marionette. This is where Dwiggins discovers what he calls the M formula, the marionette formula, which he writes about in 1937 but which I and others like Kent Lou believe he'd already figured out before then, even if subconsciously. And I think he's figured out maybe even earlier than Kent has suggested, back to the early 30s. Here are stencils, undated, of, of, of what becomes Electra. And you can see the very distinctive Electra shape in the A. It's now very horizontal, very sharp curves. And he's, he's tried two different ways of making the stencil. Here's other letters with a change of weight, top serif and bottom serif. Here's an early drawing that survives as he's working toward this. Like all Mergenthaler faces, they go through experimental names, which doesn't mean that they're wild and crazy. That was just the way Linotype labeled anything that was not finished. It was called experimental. Electra was called number 29, then number 40, then number 46, eventually 55. 55 was accepted, it was Electra. This is 40, renamed 46 for some reason, and Dwiggins is not totally happy with it, and uh, it looks pretty good to me. But one thing to notice is the ascender is he didn't put the extra weighting on the serifs of the top of the only on the excite letters. Below it is an undated proof where I can definitely see where he'd be unhappy. The G, the A are a little uncomfortable, and a few other letters. At the same time that Electra's being done, he's working on other typefaces for Linotype, three or four, including one called, that becomes called uh, Falcon. Falcon's an old style. And he, has a, he wrote, writes a letter to uh, Griffith called Neo Paleo, where he's explaining what he's trying to do. And let me see if I can quote from it, because you probably can't read it at a distance. Um, oh, let's see if I lost the page. I'll read it from here. Uh, Lowercase test characters in a trial cap. Uh, the stem weights and proportions are pretty much like this. Uh, number 70 experiment, but curves and finish are changed. Take the old style shapes as starting point. Do with them what I have done with leaves and florons in my abstract ornaments. Severe, steel spring, conic section curves, junction, sharp, and square. I submit that the result is an entirely new feeling and type, a machine age interpretation of a classic theme. To me, that's Electra he's describing, not 
the falcon that he's going to talk about here. But what he does with the falcon is he makes stencils that are parts of letters, which you see in this letter on the right. It's a letter that he wrote in the 30s, but he published it in 1940 through Harvard. It was written to Rudolf Ruzicka, his friend, and explained how he designed his typefaces. Or at that point, he had decided to make templates or individual parts of letters that he could combine. And here's the stencil that's in that booklet. So you can see he's got arches, stems, curves. And here's a comparison drawings of Falcon versus uh, Electra. So Falcon's the A. And if you look at this part right there, you can see this sharpness that he's getting into what would have been obviously a, a Caslon letter. And here is Electra with these unusual flat curves and abrupt changes and the change of serifs. These are uh, linotype drawings not drawn by Dwiggins, though they have some of his notes on them. So Electra, when it comes out in 35, has this distinctive form that doesn't show up anywhere in his calligraphy. But he's doing the same thing to this falcon. And out of that, you start to get Hingham the typeface that emerges out of the M formula. And these are the letters that are at the beginning of that letter, the M formula. And you can see these shapes that were in that early Electra drawing and uh, stencil, the very odd abrupt curves, things that we can see in upstairs in some of the typefaces being done today. Here are a couple of the letters from his uh, article about the M formula. And we can see the same shapes. To me, it's the same idea. It's Electra. He just played with the serifs and with the curves. There's the Hingham face as it was used. It was intended as a newspaper face. It got rejected in its day, but it's become very influential in the last 30 years, thanks to Herod Nordzai and Herod Unger and a lot of students in Holland. <laughs> and although I said that uh, Dwiggins never did any lettering like Electra, he did after the face came out. And in the first book to use electric, Gargantua and Pantagruel, some of the lettering is very Electra-esque, but others go back to Boylston. I think Dwiggins never quite resolved the idea of going modern. He still wanted to be an old-style person. So finally, what I just wanted to show you is the uh, italic. The italic... Was, was radical. Dwiggins had the idea of making a sloped Roman. And he referred to Stanley Morrison's article in 1929 uh, for the Floron uh, called Towards an Ideal Italic, in which Morrison urged people to do a sloped Roman because that way it would blend better with a Roman and not be so contrasty. And Eric Gill followed him, Jan van Krimpen followed him, Dwiggins did, and they were all wrong. <laughs> Though Dwiggins, uh, and, and as soon as... Um, Electra Italic came out, printers hated it. And within months, they, they said, make a different Italic, it's a real Italic. And so what developed years later was Electra Cursive. And that's what you get today with Electra Digitally, Electra Cursive. But Dwiggins uh, was trying some very odd things when he was asked to make a cursive, and this is one example that got rejected, I think rightly so. The S's and the R's are just way too cursive. I'm not sure what this is, this is from a paste up. In a, in, a, in a sample page. And here you can see the final cursive design. So I started out with that quote from Kobodaishi telling Dwiggins to put electricity and energy and snap into his design. And Dwiggins was listening to this and saying, oh, you're right, not, not 1500 Venice, but somehow he wasn't totally sold on something that's so totally modern. It had to be somehow f warm human, friendly. So this is what Dwiggins wrote in the same uh, essay. If you don't get your type warm, it will be just a smooth, commonplace, third-rate piece of good machine technique. No use at all for setting down warm human ideas, just a box full of rivets. By jickety, I'd like to make a type that fitted 1935 all right enough. But I'd like to make it warm, so full of blood and personality that it would jump, jump at you. And I think with Electra, he did that, a typeface that has the warmth of old style, but somehow feels modern. Thank you.